Well, Josh, we're going to talk about a movie that is not available anywhere digitally, and the Blu-ray and DVD are long out of print. Mm -hmm. As I assume is the VHS. Uh, pro yeah, One I don't thing. think they're still manufacturing that. But the last <laughs> time we talked about a movie that was in this uh, sort of shape was True Stories, the David Byrne film. That's true. And shortly after our review, that came out on Criterion. Hey. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. Oh, I'd be ready for a for Freaks a Criterion. Criterion release. So Freaked. We're talking about Freaked from 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, like we mentioned, it's been long out of print. So more than a lot of movies we do on this, this is one that a lot of people probably haven't seen. Well, uh, Alex Winter, who, who you'll know from the Bill and Ted movies and the Lost Boys and many other things. And Death Wish 3. That's right. Uh, Alex Winter plays Ricky Coogan, who is a child star that is, is into, is, has aged into his uh, younger man years and he's still a Hollywood star. Uh, and he is meeting with everything except shoes. The EES Corporation. Yes. And they want him to promote a fertilizer. Wasn't that stuff banned? Only in the U.S. and Europe. And even though all of his advisors re recommend he doesn't, he says, great. Well, they're offering him a bunch of money, and that's yes. what it takes, because Ricky Coogan's an asshole. Well, that is if the board agrees. Gentlemen, all those in favor. Good. It's unanimous. That's, that's the main thing we need to establish here, is that Ricky Coogan's an asshole. Yes. So he flies down to South America with his friend, uh, Blossom's older brother, oldest brother. The not Joey Lawrence brother. Right, the other one. <laughs> he had, on that show, he had like a drug, uh, he was like a recovering drug addict, right? Yes, yeah. I think so. I don't remember a lot of Blossom, but I remember a lot of special episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and hats, big hats. And when they get there, they find a big protest group, and one of them is uh, what's it, Megan Ward. Megan Ward, who's in a bunch of stuff in the '90s. Uh, she was in Encino Man. She was in uh, my personal favorite PCU. I have a deep love for that terrible, stupid movie. Another movie. This was like a big comedy trope in the '90s. Was like the the environmentalist. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so weird in retrospect now, but it was like a mainstream comedy uh, trope. Yep. <laughs> those, those, those kooks. The environmentalists are crackpots. All of them. This is ridiculous, I tell you. Totally ridiculous. They're driving to wherever they're going to go, and uh, they see a sign for a freak show over on the side of the road. The, the rest of the plot is, is dictated on one bad decision. Exactly. They end stop to see that freak show. Mm. Randy Quaid, the proprietor of the freak show, Elijah C. Skuggs, which is a great character name. Absolutely it is. And Randy Quaid is fantastic in this movie. We'll talk more about that later. After all, you have ventured miles away from civilization, hospitals, telephones, police. police, 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 police. But he uh, has the time to uh, go ahead and turn them into freaks, because why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it turns out that's his thing. Mm -hmm. is, is, uh, it's not a traditional freak show. It's, uh, he, he manufactures freaks with what turns out to be the chemical, the Zygrot 24 fertilizer that Ricky Coogan was uh, paid to endorse. That's right. And, not uh, that the movie really cares that much. <laughs> no, the movie's not really about anything. No. <laughs> other than gags. Yeah. But then the rest of the movie is, yeah, uh, he meets all the other freaks. Uh, Ortiz, the dog boy, played <laughs> by an uncredited Keanu Reeves. Who looks like he's having the time of his life. Yeah. <laughs> Ortiz, the dog boy, leader of the freaks. The relationship between Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves seems is very sweet. Yeah, they're not. They weren't just like co-stars in some dumb '80s movie. Like they've continued to be friends over the years. To this day. To this day, this year. Yes. Bill and Ted's Bill and Ted face the music. Getting Alex Winter back into acting just because they <laughs> like working together so yeah. much. So, Ortiz, the dog boy. We've got Nosy, the just a giant, giant nose. nose. Sockhead. Sockhead. He's just called Sockhead. It's Bobcat Goldthwait plays Sockhead. <laughs> it's just, just a sock mm -hmm. puppet with, you know, on, a, on top of a body. There's also the hideous frog man. The frog man. He's just a guy in scuba gear. He's, well, he's French. And, and it turns out later he has one line of dialogue. Yes. He's French. <laughs> uh, and the worm, 
who, uh, who, who, was, who was a man who studied worms and became one, and yeah. then the novelty wore off. I'd sell my soul just to be able to wipe my own arms. Uh, Mr. T as the bearded as the bearded lady. Yes. Hey, this is me. I am woman, and I like me. Uh, Rosie the pinhead. Rosie the pinhead. Mm -hmm. And don't forget about Paul Lind. In the center square, Mr. Paul Lind. <laughs> <laughs> And that's uh, <laughs> that's a really weird joke for that movie to be making anyway. There's a handful of jokes. I mean, the movie now, you could say there's jokes in the movie that are dated because it came out in the early 90s. Right, but, but even when the movie came out, there was intentionally dated jokes. Yeah. Paul Lind, who was on the real uh, Hollywood Squares, mm -hmm. was always the center square in like, what, the 70s? The 70s yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows who Paul Lind is. <laughs> I, well, it's another one of those jokes that I feel like a lot of the jokes in here, the criteria was, does it amuse us? Yeah. Then yeah. it's in. Then it's in the movie. Um, <laughs> and another data joke is there's a, during multiple protest scenes, there's a guy with an I like Ike. Oh, but uh, I love him. <laughs> Because he's, he's a great example of how they will take a joke and then just keep piling it on. And so that's, I love the way that they stack up the jokes. Yeah. And they do that a lot throughout the, throughout the movie where it's just like, it seems like it would be a one note, quick joke. And I was like, no, we're not done yet. We're still not done yet. Yeah. And it's, it's very skilled at that. We should say that he, uh, Elijah runs out of uh, fertilizer halfway through. So Ricky's only half transformed. Yes. That's important for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, well, you would lose that. I mean, his character is like an asshole yeah. at the start of the movie. He's incredibly unlikable. But if he was a complete monster, you would lose that kind of human connection. Yeah, the empathy. So you have, you have a little bit of, of him still there, which helps. Okay, yeah. For, for what it's worth in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> but so, the, yeah, he's, he's only half done. The other freak that has been created is that uh, Blossom's brother and Megan Ward have been made into a, a he, she, man, woman split down the middle. You got a uh, terrible clothes. <laughs> <laughs> That's important too. Yes. That's what they're most concerned about. It is. But she's she's like a you know an environmentalist and a feminist, and he's a he's a sexist uh, pig. And oh, now they're stuck together. Oh gosh. Performing Three Stooges routines. <laughs> Which is exactly what should happen, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So then basically the rest of the movie is just the freaks trying to concoct a plan to, to escape Elijah's yep. clutches. And turns out he has more of a direct connection with Zygarot 24 than they first thought. Mm -hmm. uh, first, the, Ricky thinks that EES is going to come and save him. But the head of uh, EES is William Sadler. Yes. Who, of course, uh, Alex Winter worked with previously as uh, the Grim Reaper in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. He's fantastic. Steals that movie. Don't overlook my bat. I work out all the time. And reaping burns a lot of calories. Doesn't have as much comedic stuff to work with in this. No, but, but he does. He does the best movie he's got. But he's always great. All of his screen time is is, is he's, you're very focused on him. Yeah. Because he's got that great creepy smile. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like his, his his eyelids are lowered, but the smile is there. And it's just like. <laughs> so that's the movie in a nutshell. That's all uh, there is to it. It's it's an excuse to hang gags on. <laughs> Co-written by Alex Winter and another fellow named Tom Stern mm -hmm. and another guy named Tim. Burns? Burns, yeah. Well, I don't know anything about this guy. Nope. I don't know <laughs> where he came from, but... He was uh, involved. But Alex Winter, in addition to being an actor, as we mentioned, in the Bill and Ted movies, of course, what he's most known for, he is a filmmaker. Yeah. And he went to film school, NYU Film School. That's where he met Tom Stern. And somehow landed a job at MTV doing a series called The Idiot Box, yeah, which I loved when it was on. Yeah, that was, that was a, in, a influencer on me and the same with like liquid television and stuff like that that yeah. was on MTV at the time that was really a bit more experimental than you'd expect out of any cable station, much yeah. less MTV, which now seems like the bastion of standard, you know, just reality it's programming. Just crappy reality stuff. Yeah. And it has been for a long time. It's, yeah. Every once in a while you still run into that person that's like, I miss, I remember when MTV was music videos. And it's like, it hasn't been that for 25 years, no, man. I didn't care about, you know, that's the thing. I didn't care about it when it was music videos. It was the things that were between the videos. Yeah, like, like liquid television. And it's funny because I would say this movie is very, it's very 90s. Mm. And it has that kind of 90s aesthetic of, Lots of wide-angle lenses, lots of Dutch angles, and it's, it's very uh, fast-paced. Uh, 
I, I would call it very MTV, but I feel like Alex Winter is one of the people responsible for what became the MTV aesthetic. That particular, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that particular thing. Because, well, it's interesting to note, too, that it started out as a completely different movie script-wise. They had written it as a vehicle for the butthole surfers. It was going to be a completely weird punk rock cannibal thing. Musical, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was more of a horror movie, I think. Yeah. Um, but that kind of, it, it, I think what came through from that is kind of just the anarchic sense of yeah. just like... Chaos. Right. It's a very, it's, it's a chaotic movie. Which the idiot box was too. Was I mean, very that was, chaotic. I, I've never seen anything like that, and that's both that and the movie. I would like. I would describe him as very aggressive. I'm Alex Winter. Welcome to the idiot box. You lousy weasel! You stupid mutt! Tonight you're going to see some of the most astounding, bizarre, alarming comedy ever on the air. Yes. The style of humor is very aggressive. Yeah, I. I Lots of yelling. Yeah, the the opening of the first episode of the Idiot Box is to get like it's a black and white video, like gangsters driving in a car and there's thudding in the trunk, and they go back and like, what's going on here? It's Alex Winter. <laughs> They beat him up, <laughs> stab him, and shoot him while he's trying to introduce the show. <laughs> that's the show. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, it's, it's funny because I think when people think about MTV, especially from, I think it's probably more of a late 90s, early 2000s, just like general kind of commercialism and, yeah. and very like bland. But th- those early days, there was some interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Like like we mentioned, liquid television. Or that like, there's like Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, I mean Beavis and Butthead is pretty you know, common now, but at the I mean it was fairly breakthrough at the time. Like, yeah, it seemed like the stipulation with a lot of their shows was that there had to be some sort of music video incorporation into it. Yep, because Beavis and Butthead would watch music videos, and the the Idiot Box was kind of sketches uh, interspersed. with interspersed with music mm-hmm. videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is great because at the end of every, and there were only six episodes of the Idiot Box, which is a shame. <laughs> but at the end of every episode, they would have it. They'd have a computer animation come on with a computer voice oh, yeah. and just recap the entire show and it'd be like <laughs> videos, int- commercials. Can you watch some videos, commercials? The man with the headache. But can't you see that I am in severe pain? Please, Mr. McPhee, just try it. <laughs> but yeah, that uh, I, I guess 20th Century Fox saw that show and said, "Let's give these guys a movie." Yeah, I guess the head of the studio at the time was 100% behind it, super excited. Yeah. And gave them 12 million or something? Well, yeah, that's the, the crazy thing is that some, very few people have heard or seen of this movie, but it was meant to be a studio film. It certainly was. 20th Century Fox. Mm-hmm. And uh, the story is at some point, either in late in production or in post-production, there was a kind of regime change at 20th Century Fox. As always happens. Uh, the new president came in and said, what the fuck is this movie? <laughs> and then they had a disastrous test screening on top of that. Oh, uh, right, right. Just like one of those, uh, for people unfamiliar with a test screening, they'll just kind of bring in people off the street or it'll be in like a mall theater and just drag people in from the mall and then have them kind of fill out questionnaires and stuff. And this so is- you don't have a target audience. You just have random people that are like, oh, free movie. And everybody hated it well, and didn't I, know what to make of it. I'd be hard-pressed to say who the target audience for this movie was anyway. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> like, on one hand, I love this movie and it's great. On the other hand, I kind of get it. You like cheese. You like being a man. That's why you like my cheese mo. Real cheese for real men. Now in a handy aluminum dismantler. This definitely feels like it should be like a like a scrappy indie that, that Alex Winter called in all his chips to get made. Yeah. I was like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got studio money. Yeah. Millions of dollars. Although the, the, the cast really makes it feel like he called in a lot of favors because there are a lot of just short appearances by like Morgan Fairchild is a, is a, is a stewardess. Is that your luggage up there? Yeah. Is that your ugly little troll? Brooke Shields is the talk show host. Which Brooke is- Shields is... The, Fantastic. She, yeah, she's great in this. The, the, the framing device of the movie is that Ricky Coogan is being interviewed about his whole story. Yeah. Um, and she's the, the Sky Daily Show. She's the host. <laughs> and that, that's the crazy thing. It's, it's a very, like, it's a very aggressive movie. It's a very, like, right out of the gate. Hey! It, it starts with that. Uh, what's the band? Blind Idiot Dog? Or Blind, Blind Idiot God. I'm not familiar with that band, but it's Henry Rollins singing. Yeah, Blind Idiot God was uh, interrelated with Black Flag and SST Records. Okay. They were on SST. Yeah. Mostly instrumental, if I remember right, so it makes sense that, that Henry Rollins would just step in and, and do the vocals for a song. Yeah! 
but it's like, yeah, I mean, the movie just starts with Henry Rollins screaming at you <laughs> with this uh, opening animated sequence, this claymation sequence that is, is really great looking. So cool. And then you cut right from that to a, a reference to uh, Eddie the Flying Gimp, which was a character on <laughs> The Idiot Box. Yeah. We repeat, the Flying Gimp has been destroyed. You may return to your homes. And then you cut from that to Brooke Shields interviewing someone, and you're like, what is this? Yeah, it, it doesn't <laughs> give you a chance to even think about it. Yeah, and that's the whole movie. It just keeps plowing through this. Yeah. That, I mean, and that I would compare to, like, the Zucker Brothers, that sort of, like, gag a minute. That stuff, that's my first touchstone for that, yeah. And particularly, yeah. like I was saying, the, like the, the building of jokes and the way that it's, yeah. you know, they will even 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 build up the thing to, like, everything except shoes leads to a shoe joke in the end. <laughs> It's a long time coming for that one, <laughs> but it does get there. Yeah. So it's it's a gag a second movie like a Zucker Brothers film, but then it's also very uh, stylized. Mm -hmm. Lots of lots of distorted camera angles mm -hmm. and and fast pace of like a Sam Raimi movie. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's like Sam Raimi meets the Zucker Brothers meets like Looney Tunes. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, just trying to remember how, how uh, Looney Tunes. You know, we got used to them. You know, all being around our entire lives. They were pretty anarchic at the time. Oh, sure. That's as true. well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, stuff like like the one of the one of the freaks is is just uh, he, he farts all the time and it's on fire. That's and it. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Lee Ehrenberg, who was also on the Idiot Box. Yes. I remember there was a sketch with it was like a sketch for like a headache medicine. That's in the first episode. And he just he's just screaming. Please, Mr. McPhee. But Mr. McPhee, of these people, please, 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 please. When I think of the idiot box, I think of people screaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, in the movies, speaking of cast, we have as uh, the cowboy. Yeah. Who's just a man that's a cow. I reckon that troll could help you. You just let him into your heart. Uh, but John Hawks, yeah. future Academy Award nominated actor, John Hawks. He was a great actor. Yeah. And he started on the Idiot Box, too. He's the dad in the uh, Eddie oh, the Flying Gym right. sketches. I can fly, too! No, no! But yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, there's nobody, you know, there's nobody that's miscast no. in this movie because it would be almost hard not to. Like it's just <laughs> the characters are so I don't know what want to say one note exactly, but very closely defined. Yeah, well, they have their thing, <laughs> yeah. and that's kind and that's of it. it. <laughs> they don't need more than that. Yeah. Quiet, please. One of my very favorite performances by Randy Quaid. I'm going to say my favorite performance. It's hard to say because there's Christmas Vacation. Well, I'll say second favorite. My favorite is this recent character that he's been doing on YouTube. What a wonderful, This like wow. crazy man character. Super deep. <laughs> it's, it's, he's very committed to it. Yeah, it's so. like the Joaquin Phoenix thing. Yeah, he's exactly. He's really committed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my second favorite performance yeah. after that. Because he does such a great gamut of like completely uh, chewing the scenery to just the most understated little lines. My yeah. favorite delivery in the whole movie. Now look, from now on, no more screw ups, okay? Styrofoam cup. <laughs> I just, I, how much you can get out of two words, man. Yeah. It's so good. He's, he's hamming it up. Everybody's hamming it up. And, oh, which yeah. can be, in, in some stuff, that can get tiresome. It, and for some reason, and when I say like this movie's kind of aggressive, that can get tiresome in some movies. Um, and for some reason, it just works with this. I think it's just like that, that, that manic energy. Yeah, it's just the pace of the movie. Yeah, and it's 80 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it flies by. Absolutely. Oh, God. <laughs> but yeah, just, and everybody's on the same page, and it's, it's, you know, it keeps up through the whole thing. So I could see it being tiring, but it, well, I, it's not to me. Uh, and it's a movie about freaks, mm -hmm. which I don't know if a movie like this would get made today. There's, when you say it's about freaks, you know, you think of like, the movie Freaks, the Todd Browning film, which right. was pretty controversial, kind of still is. Even yeah. Have you ever seen it? Not all the way through. It's it's a good movie, mm. and there's a lot of like humanity given to these characters. It's only at the end, which I think was a studio mandated thing, where they kind of turn into monsters and kill people. Right. Um, but it, it's an oddly humane movie, 
And then you see this movie, which is so like in your face and over the top, and it, there's, there's there's nothing mean spirited about it. I found some macaroons, and there's plenty for all of us. It it has the potential to right from the start, because like Ernie, Ricky's friend Ernie, is a fucking prick. And it's just like he's got like a fake hand sticking out of his fly. And it's just <laughs> wearing, you know, it's like. Especially like his character being such a prick, then that's when you, you have him get uh, merged with the extreme opposite of that. Yeah. And then they're doing, you know, eye gouges and three stooges shit. <gasps> Sorry, Coop. For a second there, I was, I was a total man hater. All the characters are so. Uh, Ridiculous! It never feels like connected to reality in any way. Yeah. One of the one of the one of the sequences that really kind of sets up for me how how the the tone of the movie is and how it treats its characters is when Ricky's just gotten into the uh, to the house and he's lined up around the campfire and everybody's explaining their origin stories basically. <laughs> like the worm is, you know, he goes through his whole thing. Yeah, we get little flashbacks for everybody. <laughs> Sockheads takes about two lines. Then Elijah turned me into a sock. Yeah! I'm sorry. I'm I'm not much for stories. And then the, the the just a little topper on that whole thing is that they cut to, or they pan over to a, to a hammer on the floor. That's probably my favorite joke in the whole That's movie. Great. Yeah. That's just so silly, but so perfect. Yeah. Man, this rough. Well, the other star of the film is the effects, the creature effects in the movie. Which had to have been most of the budget, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's as someone that grew up on, like, Fangoria magazine yeah. uh, and seeing, because this is, like, five or six different effects houses. Because right. there's just so much. So he had all these different people kind of doing different effects for the movie. And it's all, like, the top people from that time. Yeah, I didn't recognize most of the names. I had to go look for, you know, what else they did. But Screaming Mad George, I knew, obviously, off the top of my head. Yeah, Screaming Mad George did the, uh, I think he did, like, the initial designs for mm -hmm. all the, the, the creatures in the movie. And Screaming Mad George uh, is a very fascinating man. He's a, a musician, he's a sculptor, and then he does effects. He has worked on a lot of Brian Usna films. Yeah. Uh, including the best of the worst favorite Faust, his masterpiece. A film that I've championed many times now is Society. Yeah, uh, it goes into surreal territory. It's not just creature effects. No. There's some incredibly bizarre stuff in that movie. And He's, you can you can see a little Society influence at the uh, at the end of uh, towards the end of Freak. Although that effect, I don't know, maybe Scream Man George designed that, but that shoe that uh, it's a stop motion shoe. Yeah, that's uh, David Allen who I knew from, I think he's done bigger movies, but I know him, he worked on the Puppet Master movies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he did all the stop motion yeah. for the puppets and those. But then uh, Ricky Coogan's makeup, The Beast Boy, uh, was done by Steve Johnson, who's worked on tons of big movies, yeah. everything from like Ghostbusters to, uh, you remember, Species? Kinda. He did Species. <laughs> but Steve Johnson, yeah, he did The Beast Boy and uh, worked on Night of the Demons. Oh, okay. Uh, he was briefly married to Linnea Quigley, Wow. Which is how I first heard about him. Do you remember there was briefly, for a few years, I think it was on Fox, they aired the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards? From Universal Studios in Hollywood, California, it's the Horror Hall of Fame. Hosted by oh, wow. Robert England. Yeah, wow. And, and throughout the specials, they would cut to little like special effects tricks mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Steve Johnson, and, and his assistant was his wife, Linnea Quigley. <laughs> All these, all these like people at the top of their game, people that I knew about from Fangoria. And yeah. so go, while going into this movie, I was excited more for that than anything else because it was like all these awesome effects guys. Yeah, and so even though it's not particularly a horror movie, it's definitely something that horror aficionados would be interested to see mm -hmm. just because, yeah, all this, all this work by all these different people together. And this is, yeah, and it's right on the, like, uh, this is the same year as Jurassic Park, I think, mm -hmm. right? 93, mm -hmm. so right on the cusp of CG kind of taking over and... Uh, it, this is like, yeah, every effect in the book. We got stop motion, we've got miniatures, we've yep. got matte paintings, and just wonderful animatronic creatures. Oh yeah, I mean Ricky is fantastic. Like, yeah, that side of his of his uh, his makeup when he gets angry after the after the Shakespeare. <laughs> 
play. <laughs> yeah. And just like things start spurting and <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Oh, man, it's and great. And I can't imagine how uncomfortable that makeup was because he has these fake teeth in where he can't close his mouth. Yeah. He's constantly drooling through the whole movie, and that's real drool. Because he can't, he can't close his mouth. He gets swallowed. That's, that's it. There's nowhere for it to go. <laughs> And then the, the full-size monsters at the end. Yeah. When uh, Stewie Gluck. We haven't even talked about Stewie Gluck. That's oh. going to be a separate thing. Uh, <laughs> but Monster Stewie and then the full Beast Boy. Yeah. Uh, they look great. The, the big animatronic. Uh, his eyeballs are going in every direction. <laughs> and, I, and that style seems to be like the look of them uh, influenced by the, what was that, Hot Rod Monster? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, Ed Roth? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's probably influenced by that. Might they be. look they look very similar. Yeah. Ooh, I'm shaking. But Stewie Gluck. <laughs> Let's talk about Stewie. Possibly one of my favorite comedy characters oh my in God. a movie ever. <laughs> look! I got a rare still from your first season on the Baker's Dozen. Could you sign it for me, please? So good. It's just a little kid constantly yelling, but he's like a, a Ricky Coogan fanboy. <laughs> he initially appears on the plane. <laughs> and that, that goes with the, the kind of over-the-top style of the whole movie. Where Very much. It's not just a kid that's like yelling and is a fanboy, but they gave him these big goofy ears, just big, little things. Big chunky glasses, and like of course he's got to have like big puffy red hair. <laughs> Just be just the the epitome of of the apple cheeked red rosy kid, just like turned up 100. percent Yeah, <laughs> which makes it more satisfying when he's constantly getting abused. Oh God! Of course I'll print it. America needs to know. Bert, give Mr. Gluck his fee and show him the way out. That's okay. I know the way out. <laughs> which that uh, the stuntman for that is Deep Roy. Who shows up earlier in yes. the movie when the when he he's trying to explain that the uh, there are no side effects to Zygrot 24, and as he's explaining it, he keeps getting smaller and smaller. Hey, wait a minute. One of those is Deep Roy, who yeah. is the Oompa Loompas in Tim Burton's That's right. uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory movie, and yeah, he was the stunt double for that part. Yeah, because he keeps he's jumping small out enough windows. to yeah. be a small child. Speaking of little people, though, in, in that part where the guy keeps shrinking, the last one is Michu. That's right. The world's smallest man. <laughs> well, I think he passed away a couple years ago. Yeah. But he was, uh, I knew him most from the movie Waxwork. So we're saying, star-studded movie. It's uh, Michu's in it. Yeah. What Cal more could you need? Michu's in it. Deep Roy's in it. Calvert DeForest is in it. What's the matter? Right over the little rock stuff. Welcome to show business, moron. <laughs> Yeah, that's another thing that I, a lot of people, as far as like dated references go. I wouldn't have been at the time. Not at the time, but I don't know how many people know who that is now. Yeah. He still kind of works as just like a weird observer of everything yeah. that's going on. And that's, yeah, that's that's one that might might not have aged for everybody, but is is wonderful to see. <laughs> Great to see him again. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, also cameo in that sequence, there's the uh, the clown that is, will fart your weight. I bet you worry about... Uh... 107. <laughs> uh, one of the, 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 the like white trash lady that's in the foreground of that shot, that's Catherine Hardwick, who did the production design right. for this movie, <laughs> went on to direct, infamously direct the first Twilight film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's, yeah. There's that. They're um, in Freaks. There's the director of Twilight. We, we're talking about not just jokes, but like production design of the movie and how... It, it's it feels so much bigger than a movie like this feels like it should like Absolutely. his whole uh, Elijah's whole compound like the look of all that which was Catherine Hardwick is mm -hmm. great and then yeah right in the center of it you have this big Randy Quaid head <laughs> the uh, yeah just the look of that whole compound and then even the uh, the outhouse that they're all yeah. in like it, it looks almost like Tim Burton-y like from that era Tim Burton yeah just yeah there's that great design of like ramshackle uh, but you know, huge, and just the sense of the space is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, and the and the the bit with the, where Tom Stern gets to get in there as the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably my other favorite joke in the movie is anything <laughs> all the milkman stuff. Yeah. Which is the setup is yeah Tom Stern co-writer of the film is a milkman and Ricky Coogan tries to escape by stealing his his milkman costume. <laughs> I, I guess all the other freaks have the same idea. You gotta be kidding me! A dozen milkmen. Twelve milkmen is theoretically possible. Yeah, yeah. Thirteen is silly. 
That's a lot of milkmen on the same route. No wonder they fight. How oblivious he is to his surroundings sometimes. <laughs> Like, He's as dumb as he needs to be for any given joke. Yes. And that's kind of all the characters. <laughs> the club! Is the club still a thing? Yeah. Does that still exist? I still see that around. Oh, people still use it? They do. Okay. Yeah. 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 You might have to might have to go a little niche to find it these days. Go to a specialty store. Mm. Is it like a hipster thing now? No. <laughs> It's a club, dude. <laughs> Are people using the club ironically? Now? They want analog alarms for their cars. <laughs> Just something that can, you know, something that's got some weight to it. <laughs> but speaking of uh, fetishized hipster things, most recently, this is what spurred the whole idea to do this discussion. Mm-hmm. Freak just had itself a nice little reissue soundtrack. Mm-hmm. The good folks at Mondo have put together. Uh, it's both the score and the songs, I believe. Yeah. So you get the you get the Henry Rollins yelling at you track. Well, not even a reissue. It's the first time. It, there oh, was I never, suppose. There was never a soundtrack release, and that's something to point out. I didn't even thought about that, yeah. They're uh, going into the post-production of the movie. The original idea was they wanted to have all these like big names doing songs for the movie. So they have the opening track. Uh, there's the Butthole Surfers. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that song called? Like Sweat Loaf? Sweat Loaf. <laughs> Yeah, the Sweet Leaf riff with different lyrics. Yeah, uh, which is a great song. It yeah. shows like a couple of times throughout the movie. But the original idea was that it would, yeah, it would be this big kind of rock and roll soundtrack. Yeah, they were going to get like Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop recorded a demo, mm-hmm. and it was never used in the movie. And I, as far as I know, it's never been heard, but it's on the new soundtrack release. It is on there. Yeah. Oh, cool. So I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. But yeah, and then like Parliament Funkadelic does a song for yeah. the end credits. So. Hideous mutant freaks. Yeah, but I mean, that's the original idea was that there would be all these, you know, I think there was going to be even more, but yeah, which is their a, post-production budget got slashed for yeah. this film when the studio had changed. That totally 90s thing is to have the tie-in soundtrack with all the hip songs. Yeah, yeah. Very singles, very reality bites. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it got scuppered. But now is the time. It's out there right now, and it's got a cover art by the same guy who did the credits. But they, uh, to mention those opening credits, though, yeah, the, the new album is artwork by that guy. Yeah. His technique is so bizarre, I don't know if I can properly explain it. So I'll have visual aids that will hopefully help. Yeah. But he, he would make like a loaf of clay that had the image of, you know, whatever it was, the character or whatever, and would like cut off a piece of it and take a photo of it, cut off the next piece of it, take a, and it, it just creates this weird effect. Yeah. I don't even know how to explain the technique. It's, I, th- I think it's easiest to see in the, the idiot box opening credits because mm. you can kind of see like it actually moving through and that's how he kind of builds these like moving things through the stop motion. Yeah. I don't know how he could visualize it in the first place. It's, yeah, do how that. do you it's, how do you sculpt this loaf like that? It's, it's so incredible. weird. Yeah, it's such a unique I've, I've never heard of anything like that before no. outside of the idiot box and those. Yeah, it's it's really something and it's <laughs> it's extremely unique and yeah, it's the only place I ever see it is is Alex Winter stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 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 post-production budget was slashed, so they didn't get to do what they wanted with the soundtrack. And then the movie was unceremoniously just dumped on VHS. But uh, I remember reading about it in Film Threat magazine when it was still in production. Yeah. Um, and at that point, the title was Hideous Mutant Freaks. Mm-hmm. And I was reading about it in there, and that's how I heard about, like, oh, all these effects people working on it. I was like, this sounds like the best movie ever. Right. And then it just never came out. And then one day I was at the video store, and there's just one little copy of it. And the cover art for the VHS kind of sucks. Well, speaking of uh, the original title being Hideous Mutant Freaks, uh, before there was the regime change at 20th Century Fox, there was some promotional materials made for the film. Oh! Which I have. <laughs> oh my God! And have had since 1993. Holy shit. We oh, have, wow! <laughs> we have Cowboy, uh, Julie Ernie, and... Uh, and Ortiz the dog boy. Nice. I had Ricky Coogan, but sometime over the years he's vanished. Oh. But these were Suncoast exclusives. <laughs> wow. Although, and, and the reason I know they were from the original movie is that they had tags on them that said Hideous Mutant Freaks. Okay. Uh, I did not get them at Suncoast Video. I got them at Media Play, <laughs> which for anyone unfamiliar, was it a, a Midwest thing? I believe Media so. Media Play. 
but uh, it was kind of like a Best Buy, but they also had books. Yeah. And like a year after the movie came out on VHS, I was in Media Play, and they just had like a dump bin with stacks of these in it. Oh my God. They're like, what do we do with all these? We made them, Ugh, give them to Media Play. <laughs> So yeah. Wow. So I, I, I bought them because I was a fan of the film, even though nobody else had, had seen or heard of it. <laughs> but now is, uh, the time is ripe for rediscovery or discovery. Just discovery in general. <laughs> People yeah. need to see the movie. Yeah, it's still, it's just never been easy to see. Yeah, but it was a 20th Century Fox film, so now it's a Disney film. Which means it's gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the vault. It's in no, the other vault. There's no fucking way that's going to show up on Disney+. Plus. That's true, yeah. <laughs> I picture all the like the 20th Century Fox films that are they're now in a vault, and I think of it like the end of Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> just stacks just and stacks of movies in a warehouse. As far as you can see. <laughs> They'll never be released. But yeah, it was nice to, uh, nice to go back and watch it again. I hadn't seen it for a few years. Well, I hadn't seen it in probably like a decade or so. And we were talking about the soundtrack. That's what mm -hmm. kind of spurred this whole thing. Um, and I was wondering, I was like, it feels like one of those movies because the humor is so stupid and juvenile. I was like, I have a feeling if I saw that movie for the first time today, as opposed to seeing it when I was a teenager, I, I don't know if I would have the same reaction to it. Yeah. And that's still hard to say, but in rewatching it for the first time in like a decade, a lot of it still holds up. Yeah. Uh, the visual style is, is infectious. Like it's, you, you can't help, but even when a joke doesn't land, sometimes you're just laughing at how stupid it is. Yeah, and you get, swe <laughs> you get swept along. Yeah, yeah, and it moves so quick that it's, it's, it's hard not to like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and enjoy just how game Brooke Shields is. <laughs> I'm gonna drink your blood. No!